If you're pregnant, you and your baby could get seriously ill if you're not vaccinated against COVID-19 and flu. You can have both jabs at the same time and at any stage of your pregnancy. They'll protect you both now and for the first few months after your child is born. Don't delay, double your defenses. Get vaccinated, get protected. Go to nhs.uk to find out more. This is our People podcast, telling the stories behind South Tyneside and Sunderland NHS Foundation Trust. Hello, I'm Fiona Thompson. I'm a communications officer with the Trust and today I'm joined by Dan Dobson and Julie Codling and they work for the sexual health services across Gateshead and South Tyneside. Hello, welcome to you both. Hello, how are we doing? Dan, do you want to kick us off by telling us a little bit about your background and your role and what your job entails? Yeah, thanks very much Fiona. Thanks Julie. Uh, my name's Dan. Uh, I'm a community specialist health improvement practitioner for the community division. Uh, my role is to advise and develop local health improvement programmes across our community services, one of those being here in sexual health. Um, also lead on patient and public involvement and service design and implement changes on service delivery to ensure services meet the needs of local populations. Thank you very much. Great stuff. Julie, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and what you do? Yeah, so, well, uh, my role here is the clinical team manager for the services in um, South Tyneside and Gateshead. But um, by background, I'm a clinician. I've, I've worked in sexual health since 2006, and I, I've worked in the sexual health advisor role, but also in the, the nursing role more recently as well. Um, so it's quite a nice, um, broad experience, really, in sexual health that I've got. So where did both of your interests in this area begin? Do you want to go first, Julie? <laughs> um, yeah, well, for me, um, I've, I've been in nursing for many years um, and I worked as a midwife prior to coming into sexual health for a few well a number of years again I don't want to give away my age (laughs) that's fine Um, (laughs) it sounds like I'm old Um, and after spending quite some time in midwifery um, I'd I'd done a a diploma in counselling and the the role came up and and I think it was just one of those cases where I'd looked at the um, job description and thought that sounds really interesting, I can do that. And, and I had a quite a lot of transferable skills, particularly with the counselling side of it, because um, the role was for a sexual health advisor where we would support patients who um, had been diagnosed with a sexually transmitted infection. So I think it was just really that that sparked my interest. Um, at the time, Gates said, was just setting up a sexual health service. And so I was the first person into post for that service. And I was really involved in developing the service. Um, and it, and it, it kind of just grew from there and knowledge extended as time goes by, really. Excellent. Dan, where did you begin? I mean, for me, it's all about... I, I, I was really passionate about working in the community and supporting, supporting young people um, across like, colleges, youth services. And that's where my role kind of started back in 2010. Uh, I joined the Chlamydia Screening Programme when it was a standalone service then. And that service was then integrated into the trust in 2016, and here I am today, still, still in post. And you previously worked um, in prisons, didn't you? Yes. That's where your yes. career began. P- prior to the chlamydia screening program role, I uh, worked in the drugs and alcohol field, and um, working with offenders in Durham Prison actually, and um, working with the um, offender management teams in the prison and supporting um, the the prison population back out into the community upon release. Um, so yeah, that's 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 where that I must be very challenging and interesting. It was very very challenging, very challenging. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you for giving us a little bit of insight to that. No, thank um, you. So I should probably mention that we also have a sexual health service in Sunderland that's run by a separate team, but mm. we're talking about what Gateshead and South Tyneside do today. Yeah. Um, so why don't we have a little bit of a rundown of what the services your services offer? Yeah, definitely go for it. I mean, the the, the question is, is why do people come to sexual health? Mm. I mean, there's a common perception of sexual health services I find from the community role is that the, the, the public perception of a sexual health service is just that the service just tests for STIs, where that is not the case. We've got many different services integrated within the team that support all areas of sexual health care. Um, we've got actually seven different teams based within the service. Um, we're truly, we've got contraception services, yeah. we've got STI testing treatment teams, we've got an outreach team, like I mentioned before, we've got a sexual health advising team, we've got online models, pregnancy option services, um, psychosexual counselling teams, and we've got reception and, and administrative teams as well. Yeah. 
because we need those people on our front desk to be able to welcome yeah. our patients in and or send them the right direction. Sexual health service, yeah. um, do you mind if I ask a little bit more about one or two of these? Because I think some people might not know a little bit too much about them. So what does the community outreach team do? Well, the community outreach team takes the service out into the community. I mean, we know that young people traditionally don't access the health channels as much as that would like them. So we take the services out of them to places like colleges, educational settings, uh, youth services, uh, offer health promotion, um, classroom-based sessions. And as part of that package, also offer dual screening. And the dual screening is testing for chlamydia and gonorrhea, which has the highest incidence and prevalence across the country and in the local area for chlamydia and gonorrhea. So we offer that as part of the package when we take the service out into the community. Great. And um, what about the psychosexual counselling team? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? It's a very small team, really. Um, mm. I mean, we've, we just have one um, psychosexual counsellor who works across both of the services, and she's recently in post. Um, but she will offer support for individuals who are experiencing sexual difficulties, and, and obviously that um, is particularly highly embarrassing for individuals. So... Um, it's not a clinical service, although as part of her assessment, she'll do an assessment and if there's sort of any clinical kind of um, tests that are needed, she'll work with partner agencies to ensure that they're done before she can provide the support for those who are attending. Mm -hmm. um, it takes in a form of like therapy and counselling aimed at helping people who are experiencing difficulties within the sex life, like Julie says, such as like... Um, and it, 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 it adopts support such as a cognitive behavioural therapy, which is CBT, um, system, system, systematic therapies and psychodynamic therapies to help support those patients that are experiencing difficulties within, with the sex lives. And if anybody wants to know more about that, you've got a website as well, so yeah. you can, people can have a, a read through. We have, yes, and, and the, the therapist, she will do sort of telephone assessments, so, and, and she does accept self-referrals from um, people in the community who, who want to sort of find out more or ask. Oh, right. Or if they've got a concern or a query, yeah. Brilliant. So um, how do people come to us? How do they book an appointment? What can they expect when they come along to one of our clinics? So really in the main, um, I think things have changed slightly since COVID, um, although we are working as a service to sort of return to, to some of the work that we're doing or, or some ways of working that we um, that we sort of did pre-COVID. But I think like a lot of services, I don't think anything will ever be exactly the same and that's because we've learned a lot as we've gone along and developed new ways of working and Dan will talk a little bit about that with, with the online platforms that we've got later but yeah, no um, I think what what a patient would do generally is as it said first contact would be a telephone contact um, most of our appointments now are pre-bookable so we've we did some work with our service users this year and Really what we discovered was is that most people preferred to make an appointment direct. Um, we had moved to sort of more of a, a triage service during COVID for obvious reasons, um, but it was really clear that the service users preferred booking an appointment. Um, I think you just it's just like anything, isn't it? You think you've got five minutes at home. It's like me with my hairdresser. Yeah, I'll, bring, <laughs> I'll book an appointment, but I don't want to kind of go into the far end of everything. I might not have a long time for a conversation at that particular time. So we've moved to pre-bookable appointments for contraceptive appointments um, for anyone who just wants sort of what we call an asymptomatic screening test. Um, and that's sort of, you know, you want some tests for sexually transmitted infections, but you don't have any concerns or symptoms. It's just like... You want to make sure up. you're all right. You want to make sure you're okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, for those people who do have symptoms or concerns of an infection, then we still operate that telephone triage system. So they would call us again. Everyone calls the same telephone line. Um, but the receptionist would then um, arrange for a, a practitioner to call them back and make an assessment and then book an appropriate appointment. Um, and we're still kind of doing it that way, um, mainly because of the recent outbreak of monkeypox that's occurred within the UK and, and wider. And we're going to talk about monkeypox yeah, later on, so we're going to come back to that. And so what, what can they expect when they come into one of the clinics? If you've never been to one before and you're a bit nervous, like, what's the setup? What can you expect? It's really friendly, isn't it? And I think yeah, that's yeah. probably the biggest theme that we get through through patient from from our patients is that it is a friendly service. So they'll, they'll obviously they will check in at the reception desk. They'll have their appointment already pre-booked. Um, that's a really f quick process. You know that they don't have to kind of exchange a lot of personal information at that point. It's just letting the reception staff know that they're there. That they're there. 
and then take a seat. Um, because again, it's pre-bookable appointments, we find that waiting lists, the way that we manage the clinics, the waiting lists are, um, not the waiting lists I should say, but the waiting time yeah. is quite minimal. Um, so the practitioner will call um, the patient in and then they'll take what we call a sexual history, which is based on a, you know, a standard sexual history that's sort of based, evidence-based. Um, the practitioner will have a friendly conversation with them, taking that history, and then there'll be sort of a discussion around um, what that practitioner then would recommend in, in the way of tests or examination. And obviously then the, the patient and the practitioner will negotiate mm. sort of the plan of care moving forward. Because I know sometimes uh, in the past it's been like a drop-in service, but I know that's changed. If somebody comes through the door with the receptions, would just then take them through that brief process to try and get them booked in. Well, does it not work that it way? It doesn't work that way now, and that's kind of alluded to that a little bit more pre-COVID. We did have drop-in and walk-in services, and um, I think they were popular in, in one way because, you know, you you know, if you needed to come, you could come. But I think in another way, there was awful, um, awfully big queues to check in. Um, so I think because of the really high demand that we have on the service, um, and that we always had on the services. Um, that didn't work as well um, it didn't work really particularly well for the the patients and it didn't particularly work well for the clinicians either um, because of the increased demand that we, you know the, the huge demand that we had um, so we find that this way it's managed much better and reduces waiting times for patients when and Dan as a manager does it work better that way as well for your team yeah yeah I mean for, I mean for patients that can't get access to the clinic like we've got like you say the online models as well which were developed um, at the start of COVID. So if people can't get in the clinic, for whatever reasons, work-related reasons, or travel, etc., we'll have got the, the digital platforms as well. And the digital platforms were developed when COVID was first announced um, to the world. I mean, if you remember back when the Prime Minister was addressing the nation, saying, you must stay at home, you must not go anywhere. I mean, that from... A, 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 it meant your patients as well, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Everyone saw the, the, the current web. So as a sexual health service, it was up to us to, to put things into place, to to support that provision and and and, for and still make sure it was available for and people still make to sure it was available use. i mean so when we looked at the data from the awareness 99 percent of the uk population needs 16 to 44 when internet users so we knew there that potentially there was an online potential to develop something there so which is when we developed the the um online co uh, contraceptive scheme for barrier methods of contraception in the online testing platform which is an impact of COVID, which is still running now, which is a very, very successful scheme and must still run. Now, the online schemes test for syphilis, chlamydia, HIV and gonorrhea. And we've also got a separate model which offers barrier methods of contraception. And again, that was an impact of COVID, but it's been a positive impact, which we're still continuing so to run with now. Somebody would get in touch and say, I would like to get checked out for whatever it might be, or I need a supply. Your team then send something out yes. in the post to yeah, them. come from our team, yes. And any positive results are managed by our health advising team as well who then bring them into the clinic and also do the contact tracing as well. Got you. I suppose that's a bit better for patients in so much that they can do a test at their own convenience and their own privacy. Improve service access. Yeah. That's what it is, yeah. So mm -hmm. COVID, while it was a nightmare, has really made some improvements in some yeah, Absolutely, yeah. 100%. 100%. It's really yeah. improved the accessibility. And, and I think as well, just to mention, Fiona, for those patients who've got like an urgent health need, mm. because obviously, you know, now that we don't have that walking option, um, we, it's just to make sure that everyone's aware that we still do meet that urgent health needs. The prioritised, so yeah. We have an urgent triage telephone list that we manage every day. Um, so we still would facilitate access to patients who have urgent needs as well. That's really helpful to know. Um, what do we do to help <laughs> uh, young people especially learn about uh, good sexual health? And how has this changed in recent years? And what, when you do sessions, what do they cover? I mean, that's part, that comes under the, the, the outreach components. When we go out, we talk about like what Julie says there, how to access the service, what's the registration process like. We've got virtual tours that we've put together. Um, this, again, was a, a, a response from the COVID pandemic. And when, when we're speaking to young people and getting service user feedback from the online service we were doing, some of the feedback was, well, what does the service look like? Is it like a GP? Is it like a hospital? You know, what's the way it looks like? So we'll put together digital materials, which we'll then now take out to the colleges, to the, lo the local um, education centres, um, and promote what the service looks like, how to access the service, you know, what um, type of questions are you asked when you come in, the confidentiality policy, um, how do you get your results, what does the messages say when you get your results. So we'll take them through the full 
um, clinical process of what it would like to come in. And as part of that, we we'll also provide education around STIs, transmission, signs, symptoms, um, where else in the community can you get access? Can you go to your local pharmacy? Can you go to your local GP? The online model, we we'll put the full, we we'll promote the full aspect in the community to the young. To the to, to the young people, you know, so they can get really quite familiar with what it would like be like and remove that that worry and yeah and concern. Exactly, yeah, brilliant, exactly, really useful. Uh, so our services are for all ages, genders, and sexualities. So what age range do we go from and up to, and what do we do to tailor those services to the patients? I mean, there's no open age limit. Is the duty to, no. to access and sexual? We're an open access service, and um, I see all um, patients from the age of thirteen upwards. Um, again, we're an open access service, so we don't need to be confined to this local authority to use this service. Any more new sexual services nationally, irrespective of their postcode or area of residence. Um, we see patients from uh, males, females, all genders, um, sexual orientations. We don't discriminate any kind um, of sort. Um, so, yeah. So, Julie, as a clinician, you must see all ages and, and different backgrounds, genders, sexualities. Um, what's it like on the front line to treat those patients? Oh, well, I always say it is a privilege and and, and to be honest with you, it, it enriches my role because um, the more diverse the population is, you know, the, the, the more rewarding it is for me as a practitioner. Um, I think I'm in this role because, you know, I have an interest in, in helping people with their sexual health needs and um, it, I, I do enjoy that aspect of, you know, I think, I think if every... You know, chlamydia is the most common infection that we see, um, but I always like to think that every sort of person who attends with chlamydia, every person's different. It means something very different to each individual. So you may have some um, patients who come along who are okay with it. You know, I'm cool with mm-hmm. that. I recognise it's a really common infection. And for others, it's kind of like the end of the world. And, you know, it links into a lot of other elements of their life um so yeah i really enjoy it because it's a very holistic service it gives you an opportunity to to really meet people's individual needs when they attend the clinic and i guess patients must tell you things that they probably never told anybody else or that are very private to maybe them and just a small number of people absolutely yeah and and we all have to be really on top form with our communication skills because we have a short period of time to kind of build up that rapport with our patients, you know, we may have a, a half an hour or a 40 minute appointment slot. There's an awful lot to get into that. And part of that might include an intimate examination. So you have to be really skilled at kind of gaining people's trust and building up that rapport really quickly, because obviously we recognize that it's difficult for individuals to tell us about the most personal aspects of their life. For you as a clinician, you have probably seen it all before, seen body parts on a regular basis, you're not embarrassed by them, and I guess your job is to put people at ease and to make sure that they feel comfortable with putting themselves in, in what they may feel is a bit of a vulnerable Yeah, absolutely. Position. Yeah, Fiona, I mean, I think I've kind of, we're, we're all the same, you know, I recognise this, you know, as a woman, I've been for intimate examinations myself, so I kind of understand how it feels for our patients. Um, I think particularly for um, anyone who's, never had a, a, an examination before, they're not used to kind of um, access and health services, it's really, really tricky. I've kind of lost count of um, how many times I've had apologies of, um, particularly of women for, for, for saying, well, actually, um, I didn't shave my legs today. I <laughs> know I've done that myself. Um, it's strange, isn't it? It's a, it's the little things that we worry about. It's probably about, the nerves that... Yeah. It is, yeah. but, but, you know, it is our job to put people at ease. And yes, you know, um, we're not actually looking at, you know, the... We're only looking for clinical reasons, you know, so it's just kind of a little bit like water of the duck's back for us. But we do recognise that it's really um, can be quite stressful and anxiety provoking and a bit embarrassing. And to chuck another kind of question on top of that, do men prefer to see men or women or does it, you know, different genders? I don't think we really tend to come across that. We will sometimes find that some um, patients have you know, the gender may ask for a certain gendered member of staff, and um, that might be for cultural reasons. Mm. Um, so we would always try to facilitate that. Um, and we do have the option because we have got male and female clinicians, although we are, I would say, top heavy on the female um, clinician side of life, but we would always facilitate that if any of our patients had sort of specific needs. Generally, it doesn't tend to be raised 
very very frequently um, and I think that's probably testament to the, the skills of our staff at putting people at ease yeah. when they come into the service but obviously if somebody had a particular request would always try to meet that yeah yeah Excellent. and Dan as somebody who's in charge of the service like do you have any input into that do you have oversight of how that works in the community, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, like what Julie said before regarding like, the most common infection, which is your chlamydia and gonorrhea. We we have these in in community settings, and we're very closely um, with GPs and pharmacies. We're a small service. We've got large communities to accommodate and, and care for the sexual health needs. So we work closely with professionals in the community, such as like your GPs, your pharmacists, your colleges, and we often we we encourage them to embed um, the dual screening program, which is the chlamydia and gonorrhea testing, as part of their roles. Uh, and that'll be um, with professionals such as your pharmacies who are offering AHC, which is emergency contraception. And they'll also, they'll also offer the, the chlamydia and gonorrhea screen in community alongside AHC consultations. There's been a contraceptive failure there, an unsafe episode of sex. Uh, it's a good intervention to then offer chlamydia screening and gonorrhea screening in the community. And we're picking infections up that way as well. That you wouldn't have necessarily known about otherwise? No. Exactly. Um, so it's, det- it's, it's it's population screening. So it's picking up infections. I mean, nationally, seventy percent of women generally don't get symptoms of STIs. So when they offer these um, screening kits to emergency contraceptive consultations, mm. we are picking infections up in the community and then bringing them into the clinic. We then see the health advisors who then get the treatment and we can then contact the partners and treat the partners as well. So it's public health protection as well. Right. Okay. Um, and you've already mentioned a couple of times our community services. So um, we go into colleges, we make college visits. Yeah. We do freshers events. Yeah, freshers. Yeah. Uh, we went to Pride this summer, and I know Pride, that yeah. you went before COVID as well. Um, and I know that you've already touched on mail handouts and online stuff. Like, what value does that add to your service? Like, what chances does it give you that you wouldn't have otherwise? Well, it gives us a chance to go out there and, and each. Well, this is the first Pride event we've done since pre-COVID, and um, so it's great that we're back on board and working and, and with the LGBT communities out there. We collaborate with other North East Trusts uh, once a year to attend Pride. So we work with Newcastle Hospitals Trust and Northumbria again this year. Really, really good teamwork, good team effort uh, to support the, the public in offering sexual health services out there. Uh, it gives us a chance really to, to engage with those communities that we wouldn't necessarily come into contact with. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I think the events seen thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands there. Um, and it gives us that chance to. To, to speak to these communities, um, the LGBT communities, um, and, and, and offer and offer our services really. Uh, and as part of that, um, service that we provide at Pride, um, we also undertook um, service user evaluations uh, and gained data and gained some attitudinal data on what the general public in these communities um, had on sexual health services. We got some attitudinal data back. Um, which was really valuable, which helps us then go away and help design services go uh, further down the line. It helps us make changes based on the feedback we're getting from the public. So it's an opportunity to really engage with the public and to find out what we need to do as a service to change or adapt or implement uh, going forward, you know. So, Julie, as part of your consultations, do you touch on the issue of consent in the sexual relationship? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it would... It, it forms part of all, all of our sexual histories. Um, we recognise that not all sex is consensual. Um, and so, um, particularly, um, well, across across the ages, really, but particularly with the younger population or the more vulnerable population that present to the service, we do have detailed discussions around consent just to make sure that there's no exploitation or coercion that's happening um, and identify any issues that we need to sort of Address and, and address support that and support patient the through person with yeah right mm. okay so we offer quite innovative treatments so what do we offer to our patients and how has this changed over the years yeah I mean I think certainly more recently over the last few years there's been um, the introduction of um, prep and yeah. pep which is um, you know it's, it's been a, a big game changer in terms of you know managing um, the transmission of HIV. Um, so we've, we've had PEP for quite a number of years now, which is, stands for post-exposure pro- prophylaxis. So that's medication that a person can take if they're assessed to have been at risk, um, sufficient risk of HIV, being exposed to HIV. And that's a course of treatment that you would take for a month and our patients are sort of supported and monitored through that. But I think the bigger, the big game changer more in more recent years has been PrEP. So there was a PrEP trial a few years ago. Um, all the services took part in that and it was really, um, obviously really popular with the public um, because um, 
you know, it's got the ability to prevent HIV infection. So it's taken, um, it's called pre-exposure prophylaxis against HIV. Um, only protects against HIV. Um, only again works if taken properly, like everything else, you know. Um, and there are different ways that you can take it. It's a medication. Um, you can take it on a daily basis or you can take it on a, what we call an event-based um, basis. So around the sexual risk. Um, you would take some medication just before the sexual risk and for a couple of days afterwards. Um, very, very effective at preventing HIV if used properly. Um, and I think that following the trial, um, the evidence was there to support that it would be commissioned by the NHS, by NHS England. And that's continued and, and that's had a big impact on reducing the rates of HIV tra transmission. Well, not just the UK, but, you know, obviously wider that a lot wider thanks for giving us that insight uh, so dan you've already mentioned that the team attended northern pride during the summer uh, i saw the march when i was in newcastle uh, it seemed like there was a brilliant atmosphere and loads of people turned out it was fantastic to see um but you also used that event to uh, gather some research didn't you we um, did we did and I, i've had a look at that and i'll be honest uh, it threw me because i didn't know some of the answers myself uh, so we're going to look at some of the findings if that's okay yeah, go for uh, it. And, and i picked out a few that i thought were interesting because i think they're good talking points so 61% of the people you spoke to thought that uh, men who have sex with men, so that's MSM, MSM that yeah. we mentioned earlier, can be vaccinated against hepatitis A and B and the human, am I going to pronounce this correctly? You pronounce it. Pablo, Pablo, Pablo yeah. virus. Yeah. HPV as everybody else calls it. <laughs> yeah. um, the remainder didn't. So what is the reality of that situation? Like, can you be vaccinated against those? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, there are, um, again, all MSM, mm -hmm. uh, men who have sex with men, um, can access vaccination for hepatitis A and for hepatitis B. Um, and men who are 45 and younger, again, in that, age, in that group, in that population, MSM, can access the HPV vaccination. And is that because they're, they're thought to be? And that's, yeah, just because of um, looking at the evidence and statistics, um, that group of the population are at higher risk of those infections. So it's just part of the wider range of health interventions that we would use um, for that, that population who are at increased risk, mm. yeah. I mean, following on from that, the reason why we try and gain this attitudinal data from the public is to help us understand what the public perception of, of services are. So this this percentage of the MSM community that weren't aware they're going to be vaccinated for it, that's going to help us further design services, online marketing campaigns to promote out of this to this community. It's not something we've done in, in, in the past for this specific um, vaccine, so it's give us some... Um, um, evidence said that we need to go forward and, and promote this a bit more and um, so we are in development of marketing and, and new materials to promote this as well yeah. and again i'm sure all the information about those are, are on your website if people want to read they are, yeah, yeah. They are, yeah. um one of the other things i picked out was uh, can you catch an sdi <laughs> from a toilet seat because 17 percent said yes yes i feel a bit daft for asking the question really because i think i know the answer but what is the truth I mean, this this has been going around since I was little. Yeah, you know, exactly. Since I was young at school, and it's still going around now. And I'm sure you've heard it a lot of times during yeah, as well from people in the clinic. It's a myth and um, a fear, I think. It mm, is. It? I mean, things like bacteria and viruses do have very specific growth and replication requirements to survive and copy, and don't survive outside the body very, very long. So contracting STIs from public places such as toilets uh, is very unlikely. Uh, these would have to be contracted through direct sexual contact, either through sharing the bodily fluids or skin to skin transmission with things like um, sores or, or other viruses as well. So you're all right with toilet seats anyway? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so following on from that, what is the best way to reduce your risk of contacting an STI? Well, we would always say um, as a sexual health service for you that it, using a condom is the best way of avoiding your risk of an STI. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's one of the options we had on the questionnaire was to abstain, and of course, mm, yes, yeah. that is that is a method. By not but doing it's, anything, it's not really mm, yeah. realistic for many people, is it? So, mm. um, so yeah, we always always promoting condoms. Um, I think there is that um, area where, um, particularly when women are using contraception, that they may um, have like a. A perception that they may be protected because they're on contraception 
but that's not the case. So even when you're using a reliable method of contraception to prevent it's pregnancy, it's not the same as the barrier method. It's not yeah. going to stop um, um, you picking up an STI. Yeah. So yeah, a barrier method, which is a condom, and of course, there's male condoms and female condoms. Although I must say, in practice, male condoms are definitely more widely used and accepted than a female condom. But I don't think we should should mention Discount it. That it is yeah. there is an option, yeah, for women mm-hmm. who would like to use one. Mm-hmm. It was good to see that the respondents, about eighty four percent of the respondents, did highlight that condoms were the best preventative measure to reduce the risk of STI. So it it, it highlights good public awareness of condom use as well, which is good to see. Which is good to see. Great. Um, and uh, we all, they also asked. Uh, a similar question to I think a different group and one of the replies said that three percent said to wipe yourself was one of the good ways are we saying no to that no to that no to that mm-hmm. right yeah. okay yeah. Um, and then two percent said have a wee which I'm guessing same doesn't doesn't get you out of the no, no, situation no I mean as Dan said earlier most um, the rate sexually transmitted infections are either through skin to skin contact or through exchange of the sexual fluids. And we haven't got to forget that that exchange could be through oral sexual contact mm. as well as vaginal or anal sexual contact. So, um, again, there's a, there's a yeah. wider aspect mm. of transmission there. Yeah. It's not just straightforward mm. intercourse. Mm. Like so from, from, from uh, when a male and female get sexually aroused, uh, the body has a natural hormonal response to lubricate sex. That's to prepare the body for sex and it starts to release fluids in the form of vaginal fluid and pre fluid. It's these two fluids that are responsible for transmitting infections such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, HIV, and can also cause pregnancy as well. And without any kind of barrier method of contraception, there's a risk of pregnancy and risk of transmission of an STI. Um, and another question that was asked, um, which I know is a really interesting one, is um, who has access to your health records besides you as a patient, because patients are able to access their records, and also the sexual health clinic, um, and you put them through a little bit of a list. So what's the reality of who can access your sexual health record? So the reality is is, is that we do have a standalone um, patient electronic record system, so it's only the team here that work in the sexual health department that would be able to access those records. And really in line with good practice, even our practitioners are only accessing those records in the course of their duties. So if they've got a legitimate reason to access the record for that person's care, then they would do that. But um, we do have an enhanced level of confidentiality, which I think a lot of, not a lot of people know about. Um, we sometimes have patients coming along who are really frightened to give like their the, the the kind of their demographics and they'll use kind of different names or you know change a date of birth that kind of thing because they're worried about confidentiality um but when they give us their demographics they're kept within our secure system they're not shared outside our department so i always say to my patients you know your gp can't see this if we send your test off to the laboratory which we often do because that's a big part of what we do and um, we only use a special sort of um, patient clinic number that we allocate each patient and the date of birth and the lab have no way of linking that um, so you know it can't be that a GP could go on a system and search for that patient under that because they wouldn't have that reference number so it's really secure and I think it's really important that our patients know that that, that we've got that extra level of confidentiality for patients yeah. there's always exceptions as with any other service, you know, health services, any other services, there's exceptions to that in terms of safety and risk. And so say, for example, if there was a, a safeguarding concern, we would need to share that information. But we do that with our patients' knowledge, which is good practice. And we will follow the seven sort of golden rules for information sharing um, and share what's appropriate um, and and. We, not overshare. Share so there's not going to be any surprises. Things. Nobody's going to be told Absolutely without your knowledge. Not. Yeah, and and I think that's something that right at the beginning of the consultation, and um, when we talked about what happens when people come in before, right at the beginning of the cons- consultation on our electronic um, history template, that's the first question. Have you discussed confidentiality with this person? So that we'll go through that right at the beginning. Mm. Tell them about confidentiality, but what the limits are as well, mm. so that everybody's feeling comfortable. Yeah. Right? Because the, the list underneath that question included GPs, other NHS services, um, parents, schools, college, and also I was quite curious to say police. 
mm-hmm. as well as that was was one thing that was ventured by people yeah and, and i mean i think what the parents want is a big concern isn't it for for young people um but as long as we've assessed that young person to be what we call um freezer competent so they can understand the care they can they can kind of weigh up that information that's been given and make decisions based on that and that we can't you know we would always always say it's absolutely um ideal to discuss it with your parents but we recognize that that's not always practical for every situation um so if that young person can understand the care we assess them as being phaser competent then um we don't routinely involve parents um we will um involve other agencies as appropriate if we've assessed if support's them, needed. if yeah. support's needed because and they, of they risk. consent to that as well yes yeah. um well you know sometimes it could be that there's a risk and it may be that um we don't have the consent of the young person but we would always as, as i said earlier with good practice um would be to do it with their knowledge um because obviously it could be something serious it could be a serious risk to that person's well-being um and therefore you know all healthcare professionals have that duty of care to kind of safeguard the well-being of, of those individuals um so in that situation we're no different to any other health service um but as i said good practice would be that we would everything's up front it's all explained at the beginning so there's no surprises um and good practice with their knowledge yeah this survey also picked up the question about uh paying for treatment are there any costs patients have to pick up at all no no everything's free mm-hmm. totally yeah. yeah everything's free at the point of contact for you yeah. and i think what's really good about our services is that because it's you know we come from a public health basis it's a public health based service that's really the the, the the big what we do that's what our role is within the community is overall to reduce you know unwanted pregnancies maintain good sexual health and reduce um sexual ill health like sexually transmitted infections and so on that basis um, as Stan said early, earlier anyone can access from any area um but also all the treatments and contraception are free at the point of contact so we have a stock of medications which we would be able to issue um, so there's no prescription charges. Dan and Julie, thank you so much for joining us. Fiona, thank you thank so you much. Thank you very much, Fiona. It's been a pleasure. Cheers, Fiona. Thanks for joining us for this episode of our People podcast. We hope you enjoyed it and check out our other stories. Hit subscribe to keep up to date with the latest and catch up with what we've been up to on our Twitter, Facebook and Instagram pages. Just search for our name.